Uh, we will be using the, the Luke one, and I'll be reading it today uh, to be sure that we all have the same information. Because from this point on, from the reading of the scriptures, this will become an interactive presentation. So I would like to uh, uh, ask him a few questions to see if you're getting out of it some of the things that, that I've gotten. And, and very well, you may have some observations uh, that have not occurred to me, which would be helpful in putting this uh, book together, among other things. <clears throat> because what we're going to talk about interactively in, in a discussion is what from the scriptures do we know about this guy? What, what kind of a guy was he? Uh, and furthermore, what did he know about Jesus? What had he heard about Jesus? Because what we know about this guy and what he had heard gives us some insight to how he came to have such great faith. And that's the, uh, that's the lesson in this particular um, event in Jesus' ministry. So first thing, we talked about this historical background yesterday. I won't go into it today. But we just know that uh, the green part at this uh, stage of, uh, of uh, history was the Roman province of Judea. The lavender-colored part was uh, Herod Antipas country of uh, Galilee and Perea. We're going to focus up here around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, that little heart shape in terms of shape like a human heart or a harp. Uh, body of water. Tiberius is on the western shore. The black dot at the top of the shoreline is uh, the location of Capernaum. And archaeologists have uncovered it and excavated it. And so that's going to be the focus of uh, the geographic focus of this discussion. The military in Galilee, Herod Antipas had a small army, about 2,500 men. Uh, that's a small army. <laughs> uh, and uh, these are units that he inherited from his father, Herod the Great, that were stationed in Galilee when Herod died. <clears throat> there were three, about three cohorts of uh, infantry in, uh, in the Galilee part, and they were dressed and outfitted uh, much like uh, the artist's depiction of the guy in red in the background with the shield and the spears. There were two, maybe three, um, cohorts in Perea. Uh, they were light infantry, reconnaissance units, scouts, if you will, and some cavalry. Uh, that Macarius fortress, that's where John the Baptist was imprisoned and was executed. And the Greek word for the executioner is scout. So that was a unit of scouts was based there. As I mentioned yesterday, the cohorts consist of six companies of men, each company about 80, 80 soldiers. And they were, uh, uh, they were stationed at Cap uh, Capernaum, and they were probably one of the centuries, one of the companies from the uh, cohort that's based in, uh, in uh, Tiberius. The point of all of this is that, and I'm going to mention it even though I told you I wouldn't, the point of all this is that there were no Roman soldiers in Galilee. None. Yeah. In Galilee. So what you see on the Chosen where you see Roman soldiers sauntering around leisurely in the streets of Capernaum is a fiction. It's false. So these guys were the Galileans, they were Samaritans, they were Syrians, uh, they weren't Roman soldiers. So uh, that is the, oh, what were they responsible for? Uh, defend, defending their little country, suppressing the revolts, and clearing the, uh, the highways and byways of bandits. That was a big problem. The political situation. Again, we covered Judea yesterday. Today, uh, we're going to look closer at uh, Galilee, as I mentioned, ruled by Herod Antipas, the son of uh, Herod the Great. He was minting his own coinage. So the economy there was supported in terms of money by, by what he was paying his staff and his, uh, his soldiers. 
uh, Galilee was largely a very rural, agrarian culture society. Uh, uh, Galilean wheat uh, was uh, a, a, a very uh, high-valued, sought-after uh, commodity because the fields of uh, the Jezreel Valley were so fertile. Uh, but so because it's an agrarian economy back in those days, most of the uh, economy functioned as a barter system. Uh, you know, farmers would trade uh, bushels of wheat for dried fish uh, from the fishery, uh, fishing villages and, thing, and, and sheep and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> there was very little money. So here at Antipas, he had to pay an annual tribute to Caesar. This tribute was 200 talents uh, annually. Remember last night, we said that, um, that Judea had to collect 600 talents. So that tells you that the Galilean economy was one third the size of or uh, as rich as Judea. Not, uh, and not a lot of that was, was actual money. So the way Herod Antipas collected money to pay his tribute was by taking a toll on the road that went through Galilee from Damascus to the Mediterranean. The caravans were coming through from the east, uh, uh, from the Silk Road. It terminated in Damascus, and then it picked up as the Via Maris, as Latin for the way to the sea. And it passed through Galilee. And he would collect tolls. He would have his uh, IRS, his tax collectors, his customs people, collect tolls from these caravans because his economy didn't have a lot of money to, uh, to give to Caesar. So since that collection was done uh, at the Capernaum, that's why one of, one of his military units was stationed to protect it, you know, to the toll collectors, and, and especially the amount of money that was collected from the bandits, which were, as I mentioned, a significant problem in Galilee. Because it was so poor. It was so poor, people were stealing. Going to the biblical context. As we all know, as Christians, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. And he grew up in, in Nazareth. Uh, and he was baptized by his cousin John, the son of Zechariah, in the Jordan, in Perea. He journeyed to Perea for his baptism. And then after the baptism, he went to Jerusalem for Passover. And from his experience in, in Jerusalem, where he uh, cleansed the temple, drove out the money changers, then Nicodemus, is a Pharisee, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, came to see him at night, lest he be found out that he was actually you know, wanting to listen to Jesus. He came to Jesus at night, and from that we get that precious John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die for us all and through him we have salvation so that's, that's the Passover the first Passover that's recorded that Jesus attended and after, after that he returned to, uh, to Galilee he went to Cana uh, or returned to Nazareth probably but he was at a wedding in, in Cana and that's depicted here in, in the artwork so he, he performed two miracles in Cana Turning water into wine is the first one. And that, of course, is the one that all the fighter pilots love. But the, uh, does anybody know what the second one is? What was the second miracle that it did in Canaan? What's that? No? Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of buried in there, so it's, it's hard to discern. But <clears throat> while he was in Cana, a royal official from Herod's government came to uh, Jesus and pleaded with him, begged him to heal his son, who was very, very sick. Where? In Capernaum. Go in the head. <laughs> now you're talking about fighter pilots yeah. again. Uh, no, he was, he could, his child was very, very sick in Capernaum. So that tells us that, that, tells us that this royal official was an administrator, 
probably a magistrate, uh, the, the equivalent of the combined mayor and judge for the town of Capernaum. Okay? And so Jesus granted his wish because when he got back, he found out from his servants that his son was healed that very hour. That very hour. That was the second miracle that Jesus performed in his ministry. He found himself, Jesus found himself rejected in Nazareth, and so he moved his family to Capernaum. John 2.12 says that Jesus came to Capernaum with his mother and brothers. So he moved the whole family out of Nazareth and down to Capernaum. And there he started, he started uh, preaching and teaching in the synagogue and even healing people. He, on his first account, the first time he was there, uh, uh, the, the accounts say, that he drove uh, an evil spirit out of man in the synagogue. So he started teaching and preaching, and the people were all, they were all gaga. They were all a wonder. They were awestruck by Jesus because, as they said, as it says in, in Luke, that uh, he, all the people were amazed because he taught with such power and authority. Authority is a big word in this particular event uh, in Jesus' ministry. And, and then uh, he did some other healings in the local area, and people flocked from in from uh, Phoenicia, from Tyre, Sidon, up from the south, from Perea, from Idumea, from Judea. So much so that Jesus started becoming a traveling minister, uh, going to various villages in Galilee and teaching in their synagogues. Because I'm sure this little town couldn't support uh, as many people as, as he brought in. And this is the little town we're talking about, Capernaum. Uh, small Jewish Christian, <coughs> very uh, strategically located, as I pointed out uh, on the uh, earlier map. And it's uh, the archaeologists have determined that it was about 330 yards from one end of town to the other end of town. And about 220 yards from the seashore, the street along the seashore, to where, to the suburbs. About 15 acres. Not very large, right? Um, but it was uh, strategically important because while it was 10 miles around the seacoast to Tiberias, the capital, it was only three miles to the Jordan River which is the border. So that's where the tolls were collected, when the caravans crossed the border. And just like you, you know, you go on a toll road, but when you pay the toll, you, you, you at least get a ticket to pay it when you, when you start, right? So that's where Herod Antipas was collecting the tolls. That's why the unit was stationed there, the 80 soldiers, was to guard that toll. They were also the police force for the town, if the magistrate needed something done, because he's the mayor judge, then he would call upon the centurion to send, send a few soldiers to handle the situation. So that's how the city worked. About 1,500 people, according to the archaeologists, uh, lived there. I'm not sure what size Hatfield is, but it wasn't much uh, smaller, I think, than Hatfield. Maybe 800. Okay, maybe double. <laughs> uh, so, so that's that gives you this idea of the size of the town. It uh, so so it was uh, administered by uh, a magistrate. It also had a synagogue. The white building that's in the depiction here uh, was a synagogue. But this was one of the four towns that the Jewish Mishnah, which is the rabbis, uh, the rabbis' books of sayings, I guess. But the book of Mishnah says that there are four towns in, in Galilee that are to be exclusively Jewish. So here you have a Gentile, we think, a Gentile uh, officer uh, of the unit of uh, Syrians, Samaritans, uh, Galileans, that is in an exclusively Jewish town. Okay? So that's the, uh, the demographics there. And that's why that's why they were there is to protect the uh, the toll collectors, of which Levi was one. This is what it looks like today. 
Sorry, I'm spending all my time on, on this side of the room. But you can see the, the ruins here among the trees. The Via Maris, the road, the King's Highway, the Royal Highway, is this road up here and goes across and around to Tiberias. This milestone here was found about 300 yards north, northeast of the outskirts of town along the road. So we know that that road was the, uh, the Via Maris. The Roman uh, milestone was, was found there. Uh, the, uh, the overhead view, uh, the big one, uh, shows the center section of town. H and I in the middle are the locations of the synagogue. I was, was the original one, the one that Jesus taught in. H was the one uh, that replaced it, built on top of it in the fourth century. G and E are residences. That's the houses that the people lived in. Uh, J, L, and K uh, was, it used to look the same as E and G, but the, the octagonal uh, ruins that you see there are the foundations of a 4th century church. And the Catholic Church recognized uh, or thought that that location was the uh, site of Peter's mother-in-law. And they built an octagonal shaped church there. The last thing I'd like to point out is the slope going from the seashore up the hill. That is the slope. Uh, the, north, the southern slope of the Mount of the Beatitudes. That is the, the large hill that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Because this whole thing happens right after the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus heads back to, to uh, go back to his home, go back to his, his house. So let's, uh, let's go over the scriptures and uh, see what Luke has to tell us again uh, as I read this. Please uh, kind of keep your, your minds open for, uh, from the centurion's perspective, what would he have been like? What, uh, you know, what kind of a, what did, does Luke say about uh, his character? What kind of a guy he is? He is? So this is a reading from Luke uh, 7, 1 through 10. When he, meaning Jesus, had completed all his discourse, meaning the Sermon on the Mount, in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. A centurion slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, they pleaded, saying, quote, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Let me keep, let me keep up with myself. Okay. Uh, now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. Remember that phrase. Lord, do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go. And he goes to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. But when those who had uh, been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. So now the question is, from that reading, what do we know about the centurion? If this guy is going to be a, a major character in a book, then we've got to tell the readers what this guy is like. So, what do we know about him? 
What's that? He had authority. He was in what we in the Air Force would call a command position over men. He had a servant, a slave. Luke is specific about that. He had faith. He had faith. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to how did he come by that faith as the, uh, as the third uh, point of discussion. There's some humility there because he says, don't trouble yourself. Don't trouble yourself. Yeah. Uh, so he's humble. He had a full command on what authority meant. Yeah, that's exactly right. He knew exactly what authority meant. He recognized it in Jesus, mm -hmm. and, he, and he knew what he, what he had. And, and that was the basis for him to relate to Jesus. We both are men of authority. Right? What else? Anything else coming? Look like you're about to... Okay. <laughs> Any other uh, thoughts from this? Okay. Well, let's uh, take a look and see, uh, see how we did. Yes. He was a soldier with the rank of centurion. He owned a slave. Now, it may not have been his personal slave. In uh, armies uh, in Galilee and Judea, each cohort uh, was given 12 slaves to do various menial tasks so the soldiers could do their job of being soldiers. Uh, that would mean that each of the six centuries, each of the six companies had two slaves. So this may have been what was known as a state slave, in other words, owned by the government, not owned by the centurion himself. So don't uh, think that he was a slave owner. He may, he may have been, but he may not have been. The important thing about this is not the slave, is that he valued him. He valued the slave. I can't remember the words that we have in, in Luke, but Matthew says he was highly valued. Uh, so, uh, why? Why did he why did he value the slave? No, we, won't, we won't get into that or else we'll be here all day. So, uh, but that's one of the questions that the book is going to answer. Because the backstory to, to give reality to uh, the uh, elders' words to Jesus, there has to be a reason that he valued the slave. So that, that, will, be part, that will become part of the narrative. He had a home, he had a house. Luke says as he approached the house and uh, the centurion basically told him Lord you don't even have to come in my house, you don't even have to you know, cast a shadow across my threshold because I know you can do it from here so he had a house in the apartment he knew the village elders okay who, who, who would constitute the village elders. When, when the scriptures, especially the New Testament, talk about elders in the Jewish faith or in the Jewish uh, uh, race, if you will, among the Jews, who are they talking about? Especially in a little village. Who are the village or the Jewish elders? Would that be the rabbi? Yeah. It would be the religious leaders, which would be the rabbi. Right? Uh, and also, uh, maybe even the ruler of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue, and I'm sure you're all very acquainted with this, because I'm sure you, you've covered that uh, in a sermon where Jesus heals the daughter of Jairus, brings her back to life. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. So, so already we have uh, three characters uh, for the for the story, for the narrative, for the book. We have the, the centurion, we have the royal official, and we have the ruler of the synagogue. Um, he also knew or had friends. When when uh, Jesus approached the house, Luke says, <coughs> and his friends went out to to tell Jesus, and. And what they what they tell Jesus is verbatim, uh, same in Matthew. Uh, and there's there's a, a little discontinuity in the in the narrative between the two that we can talk about, but more important than that for our story, he had friends in the village. 
who of his friends are there? Or just one. We really only know one. But Luke says friends plural, so there has to be more than one. What's that? Yeah, but as far as a, a person. I, I would say that that royal official, the magistrate, was a friend of his. He was also a, a person in authority. He was the judge, the mayor. The centurion was the chief of police, if you will. So if the magistrate had a problem that needed some armed uh, response, then he would go to the centurion. So they undoubtedly had a relationship because the centurion in, in that capacity would work for the magistrate. So by having a relationship with a fellow official, they, they may have developed a friendship. He had a, a relationship of some sort, which is not, you know, out of, uh, out of consideration. And he had built their synagogue. How does a captain commanding a company of soldiers who are responsible for safeguarding the treasure of the toll that is collected on the royal highway, how does he build a synagogue the size of the one you saw in that picture for this village? And furthermore, why? Why would he do that if he's a Gentile? Why? The first, the first question is how? How would he have done that? That too will be something that we have to address in the book because we have to make it realistic and believable. And it's, it, just, it just didn't pop up. Okay. You had, you had a comment? No? Dipping out of the bag? What's that? Dipping out of the bag? <laughs> oh, yeah, there are some uh, Bible com commentators that believe he funded it, okay? Uh, and, and that very well may be, because let's face it, only the soldiers are getting money. You know, the, the fishermen, they may be selling their, uh, their fish to uh, uh, McDonough, where the, uh, the, drying, the fish drying racks were, uh, so they might have a little money there. Uh, but, but only the, you know, the steady income of, uh, in the town is actually the soldiers. Though. So maybe, maybe he funded it. Uh, then who built it? When the Bible tells me that, or tells us that, that the, the Jewish elders told Jesus that, Lord, you should do this because he loves our people and he built our synagogue, I imagine much more than just giving them some money. Because the word built. But that's, that's just me. I take things rather literally. So, so anyway, we'll have to uh, uh, explore that uh, in the development of the, of the narrative as well. We've been talking about that uh, in okay. regards to your, your uh, servant or slave, you call it there. There's a different perception here of who the servant was because there was a peer-to-peer -peer relationship between the two of them, obviously. It denotes that he was not a slave by obligation, but he was a servant because he liked the person the way he did his job per se, and he was more cohesive to his line of thinking and they became compatible as friends, perhaps, more so than as a slave and a slave owner. Yeah. yeah. Is that the perception? That's why I've always thought. Well, that has to be part of it. There, there has to be an affection there. Uh, if he was just a slave, just doing menial tasks for the unit, and he was deathly ill, would if that was the only basis of their relationship, would it would work. Well, would would he have uh, had? Would he have? Would he have spent the so-called political capital to ask the elders of the village to go to Jesus and encourage him to? Or would he have spent the political capital to ask? the magistrate of the village to go to Jesus. No, I don't think so. So there has to be a relationship there. Uh, if it was his personal slave, and that's not out of the out of the question, then he could then he could have had a relationship um, with him over the years to go uh, and have a friendship. And being his slave was just uh, a difference of position and not really a, a matter of ownership or servitude. So, so there's you know, there's a whole spectrum 
of relationships that, that tie the centurion to the servant that will have to be defined, if, if I'm following you. Yeah, I'm following you. Okay. Would the centurion have been married? Normally, uh, normally, uh, uh, military people, uh, especially in the Roman army, but since this is Galilean, you can't be sure, but normally a, uh, a uh, military person could not marry until they had retired from the military or had signed up for their second enlistment. So they had to serve the first enlistment, which for an auxiliary unit, such as what we talked about last night, that was 25 years. Remember if I said that unit was formed in 9 AD, that means in 34 AD, then if, uh, if they retired, they could uh, take a wife. If they stayed in, then because then they would be up so high as an officer, they could have a family. So the chances are no, but of course we don't know. We can we can write that into the story, but that would be pure fiction. I just was wondering when he said, "You don't need to trouble yourself to come to my house." If he had told his wife, "Hey, Jesus is coming," and she said, "Oh no, he's not." <laughs> I can I'm never clean this. I can never clean up this mess in time. <laughs> Tell him to hot heal the yeah, yeah, from outside. <laughs> That's good, Steve. That's good. It was the wife who had great. <laughs> so, so are there any other points of discussion? This, that for for this for this encounter with Jesus, he had to have done a lot of things in this village to get the Jewish elders to tell Jesus that, Lord, do this for him because he loves our nation. How does a military man, not being of the same race, show that he loves the Jews? What did he do? What did he do? But he had them, he had a reputation for loving the, uh, the Jews, he, so much so that he built their synagogue. So there's some plot elements there for, for the book. So, Jan and I have a lot of work to do. And, and feel free to email me with you're suggestions. All, you're proposing all these questions. You're not expecting Exactly. No, no. I, you asked me to incorporate about writing a book, and that's what I'm doing. These are plot elements. They have to be worked into a narrative to get to what the story in this uh, provided in the script. That's good. What's that? It's good. Oh. Yeah. So, anyway, so if, if you guys have ideas, Especially, you know, like we just discussed. Could read it in your book. Oh, yeah. yeah you, you'll get the, an acknowledgement. Right. <laughs> so, final, final question. Not the, well, the final, no, this is not the final question. What had he heard about Jesus? So, he's stationed there. He's in charge of men that are guarding the, the treasure from the toll and being local police force. Uh, he's a, he must know Jairus, right? He must know the magistrate, right? So, what had he heard? And here's the list of things that happened in Jesus' ministry between the first, uh, the first uh, miracle in Cana all the way down to the Sermon on the Mount. So he probably heard about um, the magistrate, the royal official's son being healed by Jesus from him. From the master. I mean, I imagine that we're mo most of the men in here are fathers. If Jesus healed your son, wouldn't you share that joy? You would tell everybody, especially people you had a relationship with. And if you had a relationship with the magistrate with the centurion, then that's how the centurion learned that Jesus could heal from afar, as far away as Canaan, and he did this. Right? So, so his faith was not without knowledge, right? uh, And from that same, uh, that same uh, uh, magistrate, that's because the magistrate obviously had gone to Canaan to get Jesus to do that, then he may have been from Canaan, and he, he would therefore know about Jesus uh, turning the water into wine, the wedding, right? Otherwise, the magistrate wouldn't have known to go to Canaan to get him to heal his son, right? To which... Uh, <laughs> Remember, I said from the from the forum that uh, that uh, you know, my target audience is men like me. 
think, as bad as that is. And, and so I go, okay, what would be the typical fighter pilot's response to the magistrate telling him that you would not believe this guy? I was just up in Cana, and he turned six of the big ritual uh, vessels full of water, turned them into wine. And, and guess what? He just, he just arrived here with his mother and his brothers. And what would be the fighter pilot's response? Well, great, because here he's got a whole lake to work with. <laughs> Did I'm done. <laughs> because one, the yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. <clears throat> my point about adding that that little uh, bit of uh, unsuccessful humor is to point out that to be believable, I think that uh, the the whole thing, the the, the centurions. Uh, I think it was Joanne was talking about uh, tone and voice. The whole voice uh, needs to be uh, believable so that a person can relate to it. They're not going to follow this centurion to his faith and his belief in Christ if they can't relate to him up front. So having him be a soldier who likes, likes to drink wine and is glad that Jesus is here because we've got a whole lake for him to work with, that I think would be you know, humorous, but realistic and relatable uh, point in, uh, in the narrative. So, uh, he, I, he could have also found out that Jesus had done had uh, caused that great commotion in the, in the temple where he drove out the money changers. Because uh, John also says that when he returned to Galilee, all the Galileans were happy to see him because they knew of what he had done in the temple. So that means the word had gotten from Jerusalem to Galilee because of the pilgrims coming down from Galilee and then going back home. So you probably heard about, uh, or he may have, he may have heard about that. He talked with power and authority in the synagogue. It would be Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, that uh, would probably share that information. Maybe, maybe the rabbis. Because if he sent the elders, the rabbi or rabbis, and uh, the ruler of the, of the synagogue to meet Jesus with this petition, then then uh, he probably would have heard from them how Jesus taught. And it was a new message, not, not like the teachers of the law teach, a new message with power and authority. And for casting out a demon in the synagogue, probably Jairus. Again, putting it on a, a relatable level, uh, you know, Jairus could be telling him, wow, you'll never believe what, what happened on, on the Sabbath. You'll never believe what happened in our synagogue on you know, we're so glad you built it. And now Jesus, this new guy in town, Jesus is using that forum to cast demons out of the possessed and healing people left and right. So those are all elements that if the centurion knew about them will need to be uh, incorporated in the book. Now, with all of that knowledge, how had he come to such great faith. His great faith was demonstrated by his whole approach to Jesus. He started, if you, uh, if you look at what he says, he starts with the word Lord. He starts with the word Lord. And how would a Gentile, commander of a company, know to address Jesus as Lord? But he did so. He recognized and, uh, Jesus' great authority, and he acknowledged it by calling him Lord. The first word out of his mouth was the Lord. He humbled himself. I think, Steve, you pointed that out. He humbled himself by saying, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. And he believed what he had heard. Luke says that he had heard about Jesus. That means that, Jerry? Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't it be kind of like Paul being struck down on the road to Damascus and his words out of his mouth, Lord? Uh, you know it by the recognition or the, right. the nature around or and by what other people around have been referring to him? Uh, the second is certainly true. I, I don't believe that he had an epiphany. Uh, uh, 
as myself, I don't believe that he was struck down with a realization that, that Jesus uh, you know, was the Son of God uh, at, at this point. No, but, but was it Paul? <clears throat> Paul didn't really have an epiphany, I don't think. I, he, he recognized from the testimony of Philip being stoned and being there and seeing what transpired that, that Jesus was who Jesus was supposed to be. It was playing on him because the Lord asked him, he said, why do you kick against the things you already know? Right. And, and this man's been over this in this land watching him travel here and the miracles has taken place. I think he recognized him from his witness. Yeah, yeah from, from all of it. Yeah. Yeah, from the combination of what he heard and what he saw, what he witnessed. Yeah. Um, and he believed what he had heard with, uh, without ever seeing Jesus. Luke is specific about that. He had heard about Jesus. To me, that means he had not laid, laid eyes on him. In this little village of 1,500 people, he had not met Jesus yet. Didn't know him. Couldn't, couldn't pick him out of a lineup if he's the chief of police. Couldn't pick him out of a lineup. But he had heard about it. But he had faith. He, he knew in his heart that Jesus could do this thing of healing someone very dear to him. Some, someone he valued highly. It, you know, another translation is that, that the, the servant or the slave was very dear to him. Uh, so, what is faith? I take uh, the definition of faith from Hebrews. It's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And that, and that defines the centurion's faith. He had not seen it, but he was certain, he was sure that Jesus could do this great thing and heal his servant who was on the point of death. Matthew says he was paralyzed. He was paralyzed, and Luke says he was at the point of death. So that's, uh, that is my definition of faith, uh, and I believe it to be, and maybe that's why I can relate to this guy so much, you know, and I want to tell his story. I want to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ through his eyes and his experience. And that's what he says, it's the evidence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Trial type thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. The legal evidence. That's right. so. Well, thank you for uh, once again uh, allowing me to uh, to uh, you know, provide some detail and uh, depth to uh, uh, a particular uh, uh, episode or event in, in Jesus' uh, ministry. I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to be here and do this. And I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, if we have any. John. When are you going to have your book out? Uh, my, my writing cycle uh -huh. uh, is uh, for a book such as this is about three years to, again, to get some writing stuff in here. The first year is research, and I think you can see that I've been doing some research. You know? uh, this process started about this time last year after we came home from the Holy Land, and I actually walked the streets of Capernaum, and I knew I was led by God to write this book. Because I had been where Jesus walked. I had been where this, where this uh, centurion had served. Uh, and so the research began. I mean, I already knew some of it. Um, but the in-depth research began. The second year is called the year of composition. It's where you take these plot elements that you determine need to be in the narrative. And you put them in the flow so that it all is naturally paced uh, uh, and, and, and it, it makes connections. It makes connections with relationships, his relationship, let's say, with Jairus, or the relationship with the magistrate, and what he learns from them. You know, that has to be paced out. You know, he, he, he shows up with his unit to do this job, to take over from, let's so say, there was some quotation, and his century shows up replacing another century. Then, and then, uh, he gets to know this magistrate, you know, so then he learns about the, 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 uh, the, that Jesus has come to town, he, this is the guy that changed the water into wine, and then he learns from the magistrate that he, he, he healed my son. Well, that's got to be paced out among all the other things. Like, how did he come to decide to build a synagogue? You know? uh, and then, building a synagogue, 
and, and Jerry, you know, you've, you've, you've written a book about building a house and selling builders. It, it's, you know, you're not going to do that overnight, right? So that's going to take time. Uh, uh, anyway, so so the, the composition and starting to starting to fill in the chapters of the narrative is the second year. And we're starting that, Jen and I are starting that after we return home after, from our next trip where we're going to visit a lot of uh, Roman uh, ruins and museums to get a better, almost tactile uh, understanding or appreciation of the Roman military and how they lived day to day. So, because I want this to be authentic. I, I don't want to get a review from some Roman military self-appointed expert on Amazon that says, oh, Dilly's, Dilly's full of he does he, I don't, but I don't want to get one. <laughs> Why? Why do I not want to get one? It's not about me. It's not about ego. It's about selling the book to get the word out. Bad reviews discourage sales. So if, if I want to present the gospel through the centurion's experiences, it has to be authentic as well as relatable and realistic. And it has to be true to the scriptures, to the word. And I mean each individual word. So, uh, I'm not sure you have some evangelistic motivation. I thought that's what I said. Yeah. I just didn't use a big word. <laughs> I do want to present the gospel. Yeah. 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 You know, I want to, for, you know, for, for men like myself that would read a novel about a centurion, a Roman soldier, and then find out that, oh, this is the one that met Jesus. But they're so you know, gripped by it that they're going to keep reading. You know? Because the story is so good. It's so authentic. so relatable. By the same token, there may be some wives of men like me, Lord help them, that read the book or read the start of it and go, here, honey, you need to read this book. You know? So I want, it to, I want it to be, you brought up the subject of the market, you know, I want it to be marketable to uh, to mainstream America. That uh, that not uh, you know not a niche, though. not I don't want it in the you know the, the Roman centurion uh, uh, romance novels. If there if there is such a <laughs> such a group. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, it, it, uh, so I want I want to tell a, a very engaging story uh, that is a is uh, the gospel story through this guy's eyes. So, I'm rattling on that. So, any, any other questions? You know that one description where you, you point out the first word he says is Lord. Yeah. So he's not looking on him as a peer. No. He, a man like you, yeah. he's, but there is, there, he had to have a really exalted opinion Elevate, of yeah. Jesus to call him Lord yeah. Instead of buddy or yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying. He's, right. He, so what did he's heard all these things, but, but the process he went through uh -huh. to conclude this guy is above my pay grade. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because who did, who does he as a centurion report to? He reports to the commander of the cohort, the tribune, uh, and and that guy would be called Lord, maybe. Uh, and then who does the tribune report to? The king, king Anapas. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. He has an elevated appreciation of Jesus' authority. And he humbles himself to him. Yeah. There are others? Yes, sir. Uh, can I write it forward to your book so, so I can just everybody would go, who in the heck is Tom Cole? <laughs> <laughs> Give me your, give me your card. <laughs> Don't tell them where to go. No, I'll, I'll take the card home. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I wasn't here from the beginning, but yesterday you had mentioned that the two centurions could be one and the same. Is that the direction you're going with your book? Yes, yeah, so that will, that will be, that will be fiction. Okay. That will be fiction. Uh, because um, uh, we know that this guy was not uh, an Italian, right? Um, so, so yes, that, that part will be, will not be authentic to the uh, political situation in the Romans. Uh, but I think, you know, 
every good, well, you know, like I, my little quip yesterday, never let the facts stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. That's the facts. The facts are that this Italian unit worked for, served under Pontius Pilate in Caesarea Maritima in Judea. Uh, and they were Italians of Roman citizenship. This unit was um, Galileans, Samaritans, and Syrians, composed of those three races, working directly for Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. So how do we make this centurion be one of the members of that, that unit, that uh, second cohort of Italians with Roman citizenship? The way, the way I'm thinking about doing it is having Pontius Pilate station one of his centuries at this outpost, one of the centuries of his Italian unit, and make him an Italian. Wait, you're not going to have this guy show why not? <laughs> Why not? Because, think of it. Think of it. You're right. That's fiction. Yeah, it is. It is fiction. I, I readily recognize it. Uh, it's a literary idea. As one of your editors, I'd recognize it. Oh. <laughs> oh. I like the plot. So, so, you, so, so you think he did good by uh, proofreading your book? So I think that's what you mean. Because that, that completes... The, uh, to me, that, com that almost completes the, uh, the gospel story of coming to, uh, coming to accept Jesus. This doesn't. This is an acknowledgement of his power and authority yeah. and faith in, him, in Jesus doing something. It's not faith in him being the Son of God. Right? So to complete the gospel message then he has to be the centurion at the foot of the cross, too. Yeah. And you can get in there. Yeah. You, you can get in there. You can find a plausible way oh, and, the, for him to be on loan or something. Yeah. Yeah. You mean in Galilee? Yeah. He can get the make, cross. Might as well make him the one that escorts Paul later. Right? <laughs> no, that, 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 was, that was 40 years later. That's 40 years later. He's married and had kids uh, by then. That's the series. That's the next book. But but to to you know add a little bit more, Steve, if you don't mind. Uh, the um, so so if Herod Antipas couldn't deliver two hundred talents to Caesarea Maritima to Pontius Pilate to pay his tribute to Caesar, and Pilate grills him, but why is this? Well, the bandits, the darn bandits, keep stealing the, the gold. Well, in that case, let me just let me send some of my soldiers up there because your soldiers obviously can't handle it. Yeah. And so he dispatches the century up to Capernaum. Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, because of the success that the centurion has, he gets promoted, and he winds up commanding the century in Jerusalem that is with uh, Pontius Pilate at that Passover where Jesus is on trial. I can see it now. Yeah. See it now. <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah. These, these, uh, they're, they're all, That's what you want us to do is write your book for you. I'm accepting any and all inputs. <laughs> my, right now my shredder basket is empty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anyway, thank you again. I really deeply appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you all. Uh, it, means, it means a lot to me. Uh, and, uh, anyway, great. I love you guys. <laughs> you knew I was going to talk. Right? <laughs> hey, we're going to have the board meeting now. John, tell me you're here. Yeah, we'll do it here. So if you're not a board member, we'd like you to go over to the fellowship hall. Don't go very far, though, because at two o'clock, uh, 3 o'clock, it's 2 o'clock now, 3 o'clock, we want you all to come back in for the members meeting. And when you arrive with you, you know, whether they're member or not, come on back in for the member meeting. So you are dismissed. God bless you. Remember this evening, start, I will have dinner at 5 and church service starts at 6 3. Just like last time. Huh? God bless you. You're good. Pam was down on Zoom. Right? You should be good.
I don't know where you're going to put it. Are you going to just turn it around, maybe? I'm going to put Oh, okay, we have to hook that up into that and just... All I need to be able to do is see Pastor Kevin up there. So. Oh, okay. So I can pull it up and then scoot it over on the screen. And then, uh, then he can see the back of our heads. I'll be back about four-ish. Okay. I think it's about right, right? Yeah. Two, three, three, four. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Oh, I'll have to download it. Now listen. I'll download it. I'll this on in. Do you want me to do it? Yes, sir, I'll do it. I'm already going to do something like that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're plugged in. So we'll be back at three. Huh? Be back at three. Yeah. Yeah.